Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our freshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with, his, with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So as we go into um, the word this morning, would you... Pray with me before we begin. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this passage in Scripture. I pray that you would open our hearts to hear your voice. I pray that you would challenge us. I pray that you would remind us of the glories of the gospel. And, Father, we would never take our salvation for granted. I pray that even today, as we dive into this very familiar passage, that you would make us in awe and wonder of the fact that you love us, that you would die for us. And so God, speak to us this morning, be honored, be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. So Ephesians 2 is where we're at. Um, thank you, Angelica, for reading that. But the passage we're reading this morning that we're diving into is regarded by many to be the single most important passage in the Bible. In many ways, it serves as a litmus test of whether you and I, we understand the gospel, what the gospel actually is. And in this passage, Paul introduces a word that a lot of Christians use shorthand to summarize their relationship with Jesus, but it's a word that confuses outsiders, people that aren't followers of Jesus. Sometimes it even scares them. Um, back when I was growing up, one could talk about how they were saved and folks would know exactly what they were talking about, but not so much now. Um, they'll look at you confused and they'll wonder, what in the world are you talking about? They'll wonder, what world are you on? What are you saved from, right? But I want you to see from this passage that while it might be a word that will make you cringe, there is no better word that summarizes what happens to us when we meet Jesus. And in fact, one of the reasons it makes us cringe is because it encapsulates the helpless state that Jesus had to rescue us from. And that's where Paul starts his explanation of the gospel. What is true about us is Jesus had, Jesus made, um, what is true about us made Jesus' rescue operation necessary. And in our passage, Ephesians 2, the apostle Paul dispels two very deeply ingrained myths that our, that our culture believes about evil. The first one, is that the main problem in the world is other people. We're good at blaming others. We've got some counselors on this call, but in marriages, when, counsel, when couples come in for marriage counseling, they are really good at finding all the faults of the other person, but they never walk in and say, hey, here's all my issues. They'll very quickly say, here's all the issues that my spouse has, but finding their own issues, man, we're not going there. We're not dealing with it. We're not touching it. Or we think that people unlike us are the problem. 
all the mess in the world, liberals will blame conservatives, conservatives will blame liberals, and we're constantly good at shifting the blame to people unlike us. And that goes hand in hand with the second myth, that deep down, we're not really that bad. We're okay. We're basically get good people who sometimes get confused, sometimes lose our way, sometimes we just have a momentary fall. We're not really that bad. We just need some help getting back on track. And the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2 blows up both of those myths in the very first sentence. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Notice that first word, you. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Not other people, not people different from you, but you. There's only one category of people, sinners. Sin is a fatal disease that exists in the hearts of every person. And that's the second word that challenges how our culture thinks about itself, dead. Our problem isn't that we're good people who occasionally lose our way and do bad things. We are spiritually dead. Many people think of sin as bad actions that we do, like stealing and lying and sleeping around, all that stuff. But the word dead shows us that sin is not so much an action as it is as a condition. Our bad actions are symptoms of our dead condition. Right? You don't have the flu because you cough and sneeze and run a fever. You cough and sneeze and run a fever because you have the flu. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners, right? Every parent, if you're a parent on this call, you know this because you see this in your kids. Those of you who parents can relate, right? You didn't have to teach your kids to be jerks to each other. That came naturally, right? They, my kids didn't learn selfishness or rebellion from their environment. They didn't see Ann and I running around the house with a remote control saying, mine, 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 right? Maybe I might have done it during football season, but they never saw it in Ann. Um, selfishness was inherent in their nature from birth, right? My kids, my oldest is turning 16 on Friday. So make sure you wish her an happy birthday and make sure you pray for me and Ann. But I never had to teach her to fight with her siblings. I never had to teach her to say, it's all about my stuff and my possessions. My kids were born into a sinful world full of sin. My kids were born to sinful parents and they're still being raised by sinful parents. My kids were born sinners. They, they've got the hat trick of sin right there, right? They're in a sinful world, born to sinful parents, and they're sinners themselves. That's, they're sinners. And that's, be, that's because all of us, Paul says, we're spiritually dead. You know, because we're dead in our sins, no amount of religious behavioral change can fix us. Behavioral change can only affect the outside, but they don't deal with the problem of the inside. I don't know if you've ever gone to a restaurant and you've enjoyed the meal and you're like, man, this is really good. I'm going to, I'm not going to finish all of this, but I'm going to take some and I'm going to take leftovers over and I'm going to eat this for lunch tomorrow. And you bring it home, you put it in the fridge and you forget about it. And a month or so later, you open the fridge and in the back of the fridge, you see a Tupperware and you, it's the meal from the restaurant. You wonder, hmm, I wonder how long that's been in there. It's been so long that you can't even remember. And you take it out, you open it and you smell it. And then you wake up four hours later and, and then you're like, where did that come from? Right. And now when that happens to you, you don't say, you know what the problem is? I just need to add a little bit of spice to this, right? Add a little bit of barbecue sauce and that should take care of the issue. Good. Now the rotting smell is gone, but at least it smells good, right? No, the problem is it's dead, right? When you put it in the refrigerator, it was dead. I hope it was, but you can preserve it for a little while, but because it was dead, it started the decay process. Friends, we are in our nature already spiritually dead and we're rotting. We smell okay for a while. We may learn to cover up and smell good, or, um, put away the stench with religion or manners or culture. But friends, don't miss this. We are dead. You say, well, this sermon started awesome. I missed the pre-recorded sermons already, don't I? Um, but wait, it actually gets worse. In verses two and three, Paul begins to unpack this for what spiritual deadness looks like. He says in verse two, he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air. The spirit is now working in the disobedient. What's he saying? 
No, miss this. He's saying, you are followers of Satan. Do you remember Satan's rebellion? The core of Satan's rebellion was, I will. In Isaiah, here's what he says. He says, I will ascend to heaven. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly. I will ascend to the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. There is an I problem in us. When you and I joined Satan in that rebellion, we became his son and daughter, and his spirit began to shape and lead us. And he continues, and he says, and now the spirit is working in the disobedient. You get to verse 3. It says, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and our thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as others were also. There are other things other than God that became our master. We were supposed to carry out the will of God. We were supposed to live for God's glory. We were supposed to honor Jesus with our lives, but instead we obey the impulses of our mind and our body. Our body says, sleep around, eat, drink, take it easy, get angry whenever we want to get angry, and we do it. Our mind says, don't worry about anyone else. Life is about you. Make your own decisions. Do your own thing. Don't worry about what other people think. And we obey. And you say, wait a minute, Sam. Maybe you're overspeaking. I've made some sins, but dead? Followers of Satan? I'm his son and daughter? I'm a ch children of wrath? I know people who believe in God and they do good things. What about the mom who works two, three jobs to take care of her kids so they're taken care of and she's not a follower of Jesus? Aren't those good things? Sure. But in light of our biggest problem, when we replace God's authority in our lives with our own and we live for our glory instead of God's, our good things don't really seem that good. Before we get to verse four, which is the but God statement this week, let this sink in. You and I deserve the wrath of God. We really are dead in our sins. Our blasphemy against God deserves the eternal punishment of hell. And Paul starts here because in order to really understand the gospel, in order to really place any value in it, you have to understand what you've been saved from. You know, a lot of times I think we like to jump into the good news of the gospel without grasping the bad news. Let's just get to the part about Jesus and how he saved me and how he redeemed me and how I'm going to heaven. Let's stop dwelling on the, on the bad stuff. And every physician on this call knows that if you misdiagnose the disease, you'll misprescribe the cure. If you don't really understand the problem, you'll never be able to embrace the cure. Our counselors, I said this earlier, know that one of the biggest challenge of counseling is this, that people come in and they want solutions, right? Even when people meet with me, they're like, help me fix this. They don't want to talk about their problems because that's uncom uncomfortable, but help me fix what I'm struggling with. And Paul's point in Ephesians 2 is, this is what we do with God. We want the answer, but we don't want to hear about the problem. But if you don't really wrestle with the extent of the problem, you'll never love the gospel truly, and you'll never be committed to spreading it. Listen, believing the Christian gospel, friends, is inconvenient. It makes all kinds of demands on you. It makes you do things with your money. It makes you reach out to people in ways that make you feel uncomfortable or unsafe. If you don't understand its necessity, you will feel like all these things that the Bible says is a burden on your life. But until you understand the problem, friends, you and I will never cherish grace. Charles Spurgeon once said, the reason we think too lightly of Jesus is because we think too lightly of sin. Only when we stand before God feeling the rope of God's judgment around our neck will we be able to weep for joy when we are pardoned and we'll, then will we be able to hate the evil for which we have been forgiven. So hear this. You and I, we are dead in sin. The problem isn't your environment. The problem isn't confusion. The problem isn't your parents. It isn't poor self-image. You and I are dead. We are by nature child of wrath, a son and daughter of disobedience, a follower under the influence of Satan. So you're not going to hear this kind of verdict of humanity on Dr. Phil or Oprah, but Paul says this is what is true, and this is why you need to be saved. See, this is why we can't get away from the word saved. What word is a better equivalent? I don't need to be improved. 
I don't need to be edited. I don't need to be updated. I don't need to be rebooted. I don't need to be enhanced. I need to be forgiven. I need to be restored. I need to be redeemed. I need to be rescued. I need to be resurrected. I need to be saved. Louis Giglio said it this way. He said, sin didn't knock me down to God's JV team or put me on probation or put me on a slower track to get a mansion in heaven. Sin wiped us out. It killed us. Friends, you and I don't need a Jesus who would come as a life coach, who would help me turn over a new leaf. We need a resurrected Savior who would give us a new life. Verse 1 to 3 is a lot of bad news. And it could have stopped there, and God would have been righteous stopping there. But you get to verse 4, and it contains the largest conjunction ever uttered, the two greatest syllables ever spoken in the English language, but God. You've heard this statement a lot over the last several weeks, but let it hit you again. But God, let the force of that hit you for a second. You are helpless, but God. Helpless, but not hopeless. Because hope comes from another place. When you and I were dead in our sins, God barred, God moved his mighty arm and went to work. Verse 4 says this, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, you know, many times theologians and preachers will talk about salvation so coldly and so mechanically, like it's a formula. But friends, it was love that drew salvation's plan. The kind of love is rare, but God shows it not for his friends, but he shows it for his enemies. And it wasn't just love, it was mercy, and a mercy you and I would never show to anyone. But God, the greatest words in the Bible, verse 4 again, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, he made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses, you are saved by grace. I want you to notice something. All of this is in the past tense. It's in the past tense because Paul is referring to what Jesus already did on the cross. He's not talking about some gradual religious process of now you eventually come alive where you slowly become a good God-fearing person. He's talking about something that Jesus did for you once and for all 2,000 years ago on the cross. On the cross, Jesus became our sin. He died a sinner's death. He was treated by God like a follower of Satan, a son of disobedience, a child of wrath. He bore sin in our place. He lived the life that you and I were supposed to live, died the death we were condemned to die. Jesus didn't merely die for us. He died instead of us. And Paul continues, he says, he raised him up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. Again, past tense. Not that he will one day seat us, but he has seated us with him in the heavenly places. Listen, in God's eyes, you and I are already seated at the place of honor among God's throne. I couldn't be in a higher place in heaven. I am close to God, that when I call him, he hears me right away. And that didn't happen if I gave a billion dollars to church or I pray for four hours a day or I managed to go an entire decade without sinning. He literally, the moment he saved me, put me in Jesus' seat next to God so that I can go to God anytime I want. Do you know what kind of confidence that can give you in life? I'm as sure as heaven as Jesus is because he literally has become my salvation. When I say I'm sure of heaven, sometimes people might hear that as arrogance. Well, who do you think you are? You think you're that righteous? No. Jesus was that righteous. And he paid my sin in its entirety. We traded places. I'm going to heaven on his account, not mine. And so now when we approach God in prayer, I know God hears me as if I were Jesus. That's what it means to pray in Jesus' name. When we don't say Jesus' name at the end of our prayer to let God know that we're finishing our prayer, but we're signaling that I'm praying this because I'm praying from the seat of Jesus based on the record of Jesus, not mine. You know, sometimes if I have a great week, I think, man, God has to answer my prayer this week. I've been so good. I've been so faithful. God, you've got to answer my prayer. Other times I think God surely isn't going to hear me now because I had a horrible week. I sinned. I messed up. But the gospel, friends, is that God doesn't hear you and I based on how we live this week but on how Jesus lived in our place. And in beginning in verse 8, 
Paul begins this incredible summary of the gospel. Don't miss this. Verse eight, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one could boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared ahead of time for us to do. These verses give us four crucial things to understand about salvation. It shows us the basis, the instrument, the result, the confidence. Here are four things I want to leave you with this morning, and I will go through them super fast. Number one, the basis of our salvation is grace. Friends, you and I are saved by grace, are saved. It's passive. You didn't do it for yourself. God does it for you. Grace means that it was based on nothing good or righteous about you. It was a gift from God. It was not a reward for good behavior. It was not because you were less bad or had a good heart or have great potential. It's not a reward for showing faith. Salvation is the work of God from start to finish. God restored you to your senses. God made you alive. God drew you to himself and gave you the ability to believe. He woke you up in the ambulance and invited us simply to let Uh, let him save us. You may have heard salvation being described as something like this, that I was drowning in my sin and then Jesus came in a boat and threw the life vest out and pulled me on board and saved me. That sounds great. But friends, that's not the gospel. The gospel is that you you weren't just drowning in the sea of sin. You were dead. You are floating face down in the sea of your sin. And Jesus came, pulled you out of the water, put you in the boat, and he breathed eternal life into your lungs. The basis of our salvation is God's grace. Number two, the instrument of our salvation is faith. Paul says we're saved through faith. Faith is not simply a religious feeling or becoming a Christian or rock-solid confidence in Jesus with no doubts. That's not faith. Faith is the hands that lay hold of Jesus. It's simple trust in Jesus. You've heard me use this illustration from Tim Keller before, but the faith that changes life and connects to God is best conveyed by the word trust. Imagine you're on this high cliff and you're climbing, you're rock climbing, and you go up this cliff and you lose your footing and you begin to fall. And just beside you as you fall, you see this branch sticking out at the edge of the cliff. It's your only hope. If you don't grab a hold of that, you are going to fall to your death. It's more than enough to support you. But how does that, how does that branch save you? If your mind is filled with intellectual certainty that the branch can support you, but you don't ever reach out and grab it, you're lost. But if your mind is instead filled with doubts and uncertainty that the branch can hold you, but you still reach out and grab it, you will be saved. Why? Because it's not the strength of your faith, but it's the object of your faith that actually saves you. Strong faith in a weak branch is fatally inferior to weak faith in a strong branch. Friends, faith is choosing to put to base the hopes of our soul in Jesus. God has already, past tense, completed the purchase of our salvation. When you claim that as your own, it becomes yours. Number three, the result of salvation is good works. Verse 10 says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. You're not saved by good works. You're not saved because you've done a bunch of good deeds. But if you're saved, if you're a follower of Jesus, you will do good works. You will care for those who are hurting. You will care for those who are struggling. It's because when God saves you, he unites you into Christ and he infuses his life into you. There's no way to be hit with that kind of force. No way for your life to be changed, to have that kind of power working in you. And then you don't change and become different. So how are your works? How are, how are the good deeds that you are doing for people around us? Have you experienced the grace of God? How can you say you understand and believe the gospel and not love him? How can you say you love God and while enjoying those things, those things that put him on the cross? You're saved by faith alone. 
But that faith that saves you is never alone. You're not saved by good works, but if you're saved, friends, you and I would be in pursuit of doing good for Jesus. And finally, the confidence of salvation is that what God started, he will finish. Verse 10 says it this way. He says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Prepared ahead of time, predestined. God has already pre-planned good works for you. He's already created opportunities for you to do good works, and he has given you the power to do them. The question is, are you looking for it? Are you looking for, God, what are, what are the opportunities that you're giving me today? Who are the people that you could, you're bringing into my life today that I can bless and encourage? Who are the people that you're bringing to mind today that I could send a text and say, hey, I'm praying for you. I want to know how you're doing. Are you looking for where God is working? Literally, that word in Greek, the word is poema, similar to our word poem. God has started writing a poem with your life, composing your life into a beautiful song that glorifies him. And friends, it says that what he started, he will finish. That word is only used one other place in the Bible. It refers to Genesis 1 in creation. At creation, God spoke something out of nothing. He didn't start with raw materials. He didn't say, let me get a little bit of dirt and a little bit of this and let me make all this stuff. He started with nothing. And he created everything. He spoke a light that did not exist into absolute darkness. And friend, when God saved you, he took a righteousness that did not exist in you before, and he spoke it into being. And the same powers that spoke the universe into existence began to create a righteousness in you. The darkness in your soul is no more able to resist the transforming power of God than the night is able to resist the sunrise. Which means that all you and I have to do is yield ourselves to Jesus to let him do those things through us. Christianity is not doing anything for God, but letting Christ do everything through you. It's not about you becoming more righteous and enough so that you will be accepted by God. It's accepting God's righteousness through Jesus as our own. So here's the question. Have you accepted that offer of righteousness for you personally? Are you seeing God transform your life? Do you see and enjoy the glory of the gospel of what God has saved you from? I know for many of us, we've been in church so long, we've heard a message like this so many times that this message almost becomes numb. But friends, I pray today that before you leave, that God would awaken your heart, that you would rejoice in the fact that God rescued you from damnation, from destruction, God rescued you from yourself. That you would delight in the glory of the gospel. That you would realize how marvelous the gospel is. But God, God has redeemed us. God has rescued us. While we were dead, he resurrected us. He brought us to life. I'm going to invite you. We're going to come to communion this morning. I'm going to invite you to grab the elements. We're going to Celebrate communion like we did last week. We're going to celebrate it together. So if you have your elements with you, as we grab the bread, I want to invite you to take a moment. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. He broke it. And he told the disciples, this bread represents the body that was broken for us. And he broke the bread and the disciples ate it together. Friend, you, you and I eat this bread together this morning, we are declaring to God that we believe that Jesus' death took our place for the wrath that we deserved. And so when you take this bread with me in a moment, you are saying, Jesus, salvation wasn't because of anything I've done. It's simply because of your goodness and your kindness and your grace and your mercy to me. And so would you grab the bread? Would you pray with me? And we will take the bread together. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus who took our place. Thank you that Jesus didn't come to make us a better person. Jesus came to completely rescue us and resurrect us. 
that we have this opportunity to call on you today because of your son and the work that he did on the cross. So I pray that we don't take this moment for granted as we celebrate this table, that we would celebrate the gospel. And so God, be honored as we take communion this morning. Would you eat with me this morning? You know, when we take this juice, I'm reminded often that when we, when we, when I take the juice, I'm reminded that this juice for me is not just God's salvation, it represents God's salvation in the past, but it represents God's work in my life even today and going forward. Just as much as we need water and liquids to survive. The gospel isn't just for a past event and then we're done. We're saying we need the gospel day in and day out for every single day. And so just as much as we need uh, fluids to survive when we drink this juice, we're declaring, God, I need you today. This week, I will probably screw up and I need your grace. This week, I need your forgiveness. I need your Holy Spirit to make me more like Jesus, to remind me that I'm not living for myself. I'm living for God. And so as we drink this juice today, would you prayerfully put your dependence and trust in Jesus? Would you pray with me? Father, as we drink this juice, we declare that without you, we will screw this whole thing up. Without you, we will make a mess of ourselves. Without you, we will not live for you. And so, God, as we drink this juice this morning, we are declaring to you our dependence and our trust in you. Would you continue to remove those things in our lives that are not of you? And would you make us more into the image of Jesus? Would you fill us with the fruits of your spirit so that Jesus would shine brightly through us? We pray this in Jesus' name. Would you drink the juice together? I'm going to invite